So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the November edition of, of the mini school. This is know, probably certainly the, the last mini school of, of the year because uh, December is a little bit of a short month, so we won't have a full uh, uh, mini school uh, then. Um, today, it's a particular pleasure uh, to introduce uh, um, Professor Brink van der Merve and Professor Jorik Hardy, uh, one from Stellenbosch, one from, one from Witz, who kindly agreed uh, to give us uh, an introduction to, to, a pro to a functional programming language, to Haskell. And um, this is sort of the, the theme of the last two months. Last month in the mini school, we had an introduction into category theory and one thing led to another one. <laughs> and now we all need to learn Haskell. Yeah? <laughs> so we are, we, are, we are very, very happy that, um, that Jorik and Brinke will, will make it easy for us to, to, to learn. It, yeah? So Jorik uh, and Brink, people are here to, to, to learn about Haskell and not to listen to my talk. So you're, you're most than welcome to, uh, to start with your, with your presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> oh, thank, thank you very much for, for the introduction and um, just a few disclaimers. So it's, it's gonna be, first of all, I'm, I'm not a huge Haskell expert. And, and secondly, these presentations will be rather on the informal side. So I'll have some slides, but it's, it's uh, coding along, trying out easy examples. So, um, just to help me a little in your a little bit, uh, perhaps the participants can just post in the chat. How many of you have, or do, do you have G, GH, GHC installed? And can you, have you tried out the interpreter GHCI? If, if people can just type a yes or a no in the chat. So then, then it makes it a little bit easier in, in terms of uh, knowing how I should paste things and what I should show and whatnot. Uh, one note is two I yeses. Make, I can make a quick <laughs> poll. Uh, I make a quick poll and we can allow everybody. <laughs> Zurab yeah, says he, he's never heard of GHC. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I see. I see. Ah, I am. Ah, okay. Oh yeah, I see. I'm I'm not allowed to vote this panelist. Yeah, no, I'm also not allowed. <laughs> otherwise, I would have voted yes because, because I installed it yesterday, yeah, or two days ago. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Just just having a feeling. So so maybe fifty percent is and and fifty not. So, um, yeah. So that tells me at at least for today. Let me just share my screen. Ah, that's important for the social afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, good, good. Let me just get used to. Oh, sorry, it's uh, just me getting uh, used to what I can't, can and can't do here in a Zoom presentation. Um, let me just. some issues here, which I'll sort out now, hopefully. Take your time. <clears throat> oh, is, is there some way to get, uh, I guess this bar, I can move it anywhere. The bar that I have in, in Zoom showing what's going on and whatnot. Okay, cool. Um, so, so let me show you guys a few online environments that you can follow along before you install GHCI um, for next time. Okay, let me also move that out of the way. So um, one option that you recommend or suggested is this codepad.org. So uh, the one thing I don't like about it so you don't have a terminal or a shell so so that's quite ha handy to have 
So it seems there's not that option in codepad.org. And the other option or the other issue for me is when you write your Haskell code, you need at least to have a main. So everything needs to be called from a main. And um, Haskell is sort of the exception where um, getting or really understanding what's going on with Hello World is, is quite complicated. And it's maybe not even a topic for the second or the third lecture. So that is sort of the, the downside with using codepad.org. Um, yeah, so with codepad, yeah, yeah, I have my main and I just put string line, which is just library method, hello world. And when I submit that, what I'll get back is uh, just the code that was posted and the output, which is this hello world. So the other option that I tried out is perhaps you guys that don't have JHC installed can see if you like replit.com. Maybe you guys can quickly navigate there if you don't have GHC and GHCI installed. Um, so perhaps just navigate there and you have a choice whether you want to sign up or not. Then you can sign up with Facebook or your Gmail, uh, Google account or whatever. Uh, so let me just see. So maybe in the chat, you guys can just give me some indication um are you sort of getting there and things making sense if you don't have ghc or ghci installed yeah so sort of um the nice thing here is you have both so you have a console in which you have, say, a GHCI running if you make the Haskell selection in replit.com. So here in the console with the interpreter GHCI open, you can do things like, um, so you can just use the reverse uh, function from the standard prelude so you can do things like that um, and you can ask for example for uh, the type of uh, functions that comes from that's implemented in the standard library that you get by default so we'll uh, discuss things like this and so on um, so let me just see. Okay, so it like me it looks to me at least one success. Everyone sort of okay with this, or um, we have a few other options as well. If if this is not working for people, so perhaps I can just open here some some notes I've made. So. Yeah, so you can, this this is the um, online environment that we've just sort of mentioned. Then there's codepad.org where I've mentioned, well, my issue there is I, I, I couldn't see a way of, of getting a shell going and you need a main method. Then sort of uh, another one that also looks pretty nice is that you recommended this, this third one, yeah, cocalc.com. Okay, so let, let me just mention a few other resources. So some of you might have seen the following. Linear Haskell for great good. So that's a pretty nice book to read online and it's a fun, fun book to read. So uh, if you have some spare time in, in, in the week, that's maybe one a book to look at. 
Um, and I'll steal here and there example from them. Something I should just point out, and I wish somebody would do it, maybe if I have too much free time on my hands at some stage. Here with the later chapters, here from chapters 11, 12, 13, and 14, just at the point where things start to get complicated. Then the examples from this learn yourself Haskell for great good doesn't always work since there were some ch changes to say some of the standard type classes that you have in Haskell and so on. So the last four or five chapters, you'll have issues here and there uh, with the examples. Uh, but anyway, that's a nice resource. And before I go on to the main resource that I'll typically uh, that I'll go ahead and use, let me also point out hugel.haskell.org. Um, so here you can do search for various functions and things about Haskell and documentation. And you can even do things like maybe, and okay, some of you might not be familiar with this notation, but say for example, I have an idea of some function and I know, well, it should take a list and this A is just um, sort of denoting some uh, generic type. So it's, it's some type variable. So it, it could be any, any type. Um, so you can do searches based on type. So here I'm just say, telling Google to sort of return functions that have this specific type signature, A goes to A, and then it sort of uh, returns ones uh, that uh, I think audit sort of in, in a way that's sort of most commonly used. So Google is also an, a nice site to know about. And then finally, so my slides and content will in generally be taken from uh, content from a guy called Graham Hutton. Um, so he's so essentially a lot of interesting info, but um, if you go down and so if you want to work ahead or so on, he's got a YouTube channel and one of the good things of, of COVID, he's also got his um, Haskell classes on, on YouTube might most likely be a lot better than mine. And then when you get down to the teaching, so um, I'll, I'll take my slides here from his uh, functional programming course, mostly the first one, and maybe at the end, a little of the last lecture. So of some of the more advanced things from his second year course. And uh, this book over here, Programming in Haskell, that is a pretty good book that I can I uh, really recommend. So that's just in terms of various resources. Um, and OK, so let's just get back to sort of trying out a few basic examples. Um, so depending on how you have things set up, so here in any, any editor that you want, um, so here I've, I've just opened this up in Sublime. I have some basic Haskell script. So if you have uh, GHC installed, you can, if you want to, you can, for example, go ahead and perhaps uh, type in this line, double of X is equal to X plus X or in any of the online uh, environments, except with, with uh, CodePad, you'll, you'll need a main, so that's sort of more difficult to play around. But so with the other, and if you have GHC and GHCI, I sort of try perhaps and have a file and type in this double X equals X plus X. Okay, and now, Like, just open up a shell. Uh, 
Oh, okay. So somebody is saying you can even sign up to Replit with you for university email. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. I, I just took the lazy way and said, well, you can use my, I can't remember Gmail or Facebook details and so on. Okay. So here I just have a shell open and I just have some trivial random code here. And let me just navigate here to the, this, uh, and, um, yeah, so everyone just uh, follow along. So now if you type in GHCI, it, it will open up um, the Haskell interpreter and sort of this is just saying that the standard prelude to the standard library, uh, the functions that's defined in there will be available. And so also in Right, so if you write here in um, Replit, for example, uh, you can just add a file and um, you just go to the shell. So once you're in the shell, for example, you're there as well, you can just type in GHCI. And here I have, for example, a file main.hs. So you can just say once um, you can say, well, I want to load all the code that's in main.hs. And now we're just loading it and it's compiling it. And now I can do things such as this will sort of return the type of, for example, double, and we'll, we'll get to types, but yeah, it's, I'm just asking, what is the type? So, so I should point out, um, so even though it doesn't look like it, Haskell is a statically typed language. It's just the compiler is smart enough to do the type inference for you. So we can specify the types, but we don't have to since um, the compiler will do type inference for you. So if I ask the type, it's really the compiler doing type inference here. And so if I ask here, well, what is the type of double? It's returning and say, well, um, it's taking any type A to a type A, but only those types that implement what's called the numeric type clause. So I should be able, if, if you look at this code, um, I should be able to do addition. So this is what this constraint is saying. Um, just restrict yourself to those things where you can at least do an addition. You can also, if, if you know languages such as Java, you can think of this num type clause as equivalent of some sort of interface. And this interface must specify that at least an addition is available. So now we can say, um, well, what is double of 10, for example? And it returns uh, 20. And um, let's now look at this quad function of mine. And that's just saying, well, um, I want to take this double function and the dot is function composition. So I want to take the double function and compose it with itself. And obviously you can understand why I called it quad. So now I can just say, well, what is quad of 20? And hopefully we get 80. And so, yeah, various people like different things. So in general, um, oh, before I show you the VS Code environment, which I think is quite nice. Um, so, uh, so something that you have once you have the whole GHC environment, the Glasgow Haskell 
compiler and something else. I, I can't remember if it gets installed with GHCI or whether you have to install it separately, but you have this stack build tool. So for example, I can say, type here in the command line, something like um, stack new, and let's just call this project day one. So what it will do is it will just create, stack will go ahead and create a new project for me, uh, sort of in a simple way as possible and just call that project day one. And now we see, for example, if I go here in day one, um, what we have is we have a test directory, we have a source directory, and we have this app directory. So inside this app directory, there's my main, and it's sort of assuming this main will make use of this code defined in lib.hs. So sort of the default with your Haskell code is you, you give the files the .hs extension. So if I open up main.hs, um, what it's doing is it's just saying this is a module main and it's going to import the lib library and we'll discuss this, but this is just saying what is the type sig. So even though you don't have to specify it, it went ahead and said, well, the type signature of this main is going to be IO of the empty tuple, which is essentially um, IO of void. That's another way to think of it. So you have the main, and then this imports the lib function. And what lib is doing is this is where some func is defined, and some func is just printing out, say, some func. So as you sort of get, well, pretty soon, once you start playing around, you have to sort of um, get used to this stack build tool that, uh, and as I said, it's sort of a nice way to sort of just get started with a project and, and play around with it. So if I go to the VS Code environment, so yeah, so, so this is essentially all I did here was I, I just used um, yeah, in my VS code, I just went to head and I, I, I just used stack to create it, uh, a new project for me. And that's, that's why I have a main.hs and a lib.hs. Um, so let me just show you guys something else. Um, so if you want to, and, and uh, well, perhaps for the moment, just those of you that have JHC installed, what you can do is you can type in this line main equals to put string line of hello world. So you don't have to give the type signature and here in VS code, I just have a lint extension installed. So the lint is just figuring out this is the type signature and sort of the nice thing with uh, VS code and all its extensions, you just go ahead and install all the Haskell extensions that looks interesting and you can hover over um, functions and it will sort of give you the type signature and some uh, information about it. Or if you look at reverse, it will sort of tell you some basic information about reverse and its type signature and so on. So now what you can do, so for example here, I just double check, I have this main.hs, which is just this file main.hs. So what you can do is if you wanna produce an executable, you can just type GHC uh, main.hs and you can just say after that, um, let's call, 
the file that I want to create. Um, let me just see, I have some lag here. Yeah, so for some reason there's some, maybe I'm not going to be able to show you since for some reason I have some, oh, there we go. Okay, let's just call the output file, hello world. So this is just, instead of working in the interpreter, it's building an executable um, of this main file of mine. So there's the executable, and it's just calling the executable hello world. And now I can just run that executable hello world. Okay, so before I go to slides, so in, in any of these environments, let's let's just write a bit of basic code and, and then I'll, I'll move on to my slides and I'll sort of mix it between the slides and the code. Um, so this notation over here, this is just a list. So what this will do is, so instead of working with arrays and so on, the first kind of data structure that's sort of quite convenient and fun to work with is the list. And so sort of, yeah, I'm just making a list and the one dot dot 10 is just gonna give me a list of ends from one to 10. And to this list, I'm applying the reverse function. And I'm just assigning this answer, applying the reverse function to this list to answer. And here you can see uh, the compiler sort of said, this is the type signature that you want. Um, answer is just a list of integers. So either I can take that or um, I can also say, no, I would rather want answer instead of let its type signature rather be a list of just int. So I can be more specific instead of having um, I can sort of restrict the range of, of my integers and just make it the, the int type. So then, for example, if I start GHCI, then always the first thing what you have to do is you have to load, or if you make any changes, just load your current script. Now I've loaded it, and now I can just run answer. And that's exactly what we get. Um, we get, um, well, as we expected, the whole list reversed. And um, sort of another just example along this line, I can use, say, the sum function. And I can just decide to sum all the numbers from 1 to 10. And that will just apply the sum function uh, to the everything in that list. And uh, that's obviously just going to return 55. Okay. And I can always just double check the sum function. And I see, well, it's, it's a little bit more complicated just because it's sort of a more general function. So what we see essentially here is this A is just the type variable. So the A should implement sort of the type class or the interface num. So I must be able to add up things. And then we'll pretty soon get to this type class foldable. So it's saying T should be foldable. So essentially what's happening here is it's just saying this list is something that is foldable. So I can essentially fold up a list. Um, so I'm not sure if any of you have seen, um, uh, say, folds, fold left, fold right, those kind of things in other languages. Any of you? Uh, you can just type in the chat. Or is, is that also new to everyone? <laughs> Zerup said no, it's, it's not seen. Yeah, Zerup, it's, it's time to, to, to uh, put Python to rest and... Uh, from now on, it's, it should just be Haskell for you. It's, it's as a category theorist, um, you, you, you just can't allow yourself to use Python and not 
not Haskell. So just to sort of, um, we'll get pretty soon to this idea of folds, but essentially to write, so again here, if you, uh, any of you guys have G GHCI open, or in any of your environments, you can type in the following line of code. So I'm gonna fold the list now and I'm gonna fold it from its left. So that's why it's fold left. Essentially, I'm writing my own version of sum. And the way I wanna fold this list is I wanna use the function plus to fold it up. And I wanna start with the value zero. So I'm gonna start with zero and then I fold up the list. I add, so if I use this list, say one to 10, I'm gonna add the one, since I specified add there to zero, and then I get one. And then I take the next value, which is two, I add that to one, I get three. And then I take three, I add it to the previous three, I get six and so on. So if I just do a fold left of this list, one to 10, hopefully I again get uh, 55. Um, so this is also showing one of the nice features of Haskell. Um, this idea of having higher order functions. And so fold left is an example of a higher order function. And we can look at its type, but its type will look too scary at the moment if I look at it, but, or if you look at it, I'm comfortable with it, but there's the type. And essentially um, you have to fold something that's foldable. So at the moment lists, that's what's foldable. And this plus of mine, it's, it's type signature is essentially this type signature over here. Um, so, that is just folding. So having shown you sort of folding and some, let's, let's also, um, let's, instead of folding, let's implement our own version of sum. I'm just gonna call it sum prime. So you guys can follow along here with this example. Um, and let's, I'm just calling it sum prime since I don't want it to clash with the sum that's implemented in um, the library version. So sum prime, and we want to do it recursively. So if we have the empty list, and as I said, essentially, initially you can think of a list like um, an array, but the difference is list is more like a stream. You have to traverse it from the left. You can't just say, take me immediately to position 10,000. You always have to traverse lists from the left. So we want to implement some, and we want to add up the contents of the list giving they are sort of numeric. So um, something else that's nice to sort of, uh, sorry for interrupting myself, but something I should show you guys is this command. Uh, we use this I to get more information. So I've mentioned this numeric interface or type class. So if you have GHCI open, you can always type this and some function or type class that you want more information about. So now I want more information about something that's numeric. Um, so let's get some information about this numeric type class. And um, yeah, it's saying, well, so as I've said, these type classes, so num is, for example, it's, you can think of it as an interface and here's what it implements. It implements, for example, a plus. And uh, maybe once we get to sort of the last lecture, we can talk about monads and I can say, well, give me some info about the monad type class. And yeah, it's telling me with monads, hmm, I have this friend, the bind operator. Or we can do something like, uh, uh, well, 
in most languages, I think you guys have seen the idea of mapping of an array or list or something which is a functor for the for you guys familiar with the category theory. Give me some info about the functor interface or the functor type class. Um, so let's get some info about functor. And here we see, well, functor is something should be something that I can map over. So we'll, we'll get to sort of functors and so on. But okay, yeah, but back to when I interrupted myself, let's go back to sort of this sum prime that should sum the things in the list. And I guess why I interrupted myself is it is things that are numeric that should be summed. So uh, the type inference will be smart enough to tell me the type of sum prime somewhere along the line some numeric type clause will appear so let's just think if we sum the empty list well what should happen there well the empty list should just be zero so immediately sort of the lint is asking the haskell compiler well i have this line of code what do you think is the type of some clause of some prime and it's saying well it's some numeric type um the p it's it's not yet sure it doesn't yet have a restriction on the A since at the moment I'm saying, well, any list when it's the empty list, I'm just going to make it zero. And that's why with type inference, it doesn't yet, ha haven't yet figured out the stuff inside the list must be numeric. But now let's do the inductive case, some prime. Now, here's a bit of notation that you have to get used to. So this is just the notation for a list. X is the head or sort of the first element on the left in the list. And X is, is the rest of the list. So sort of this notation um, and the X I can call something else and the X is I can also call something else. But apart from the X and the X is, those are just variable names. This is a list with in my case, the X, the head, and the X is the tail. So let's think recursively, how do we add up a list where we know what the head is? Well, we take X, and now it's time to re use recursion. And I'm just saying, well, you know how to add up a smaller list, which, so X has got fewer elements than X cons X is, so let's, let's just add up the rest. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have that. So here you can see, um, well, it's telling me some prime, yes, the type, it must be some numeric type P and I have the list of P and the answer that I will return is a P. Now you'll see here in my VS code, I have these squigglies and that's just the, re uh, the the lint is smart enough to figure out I'm implementing something that's already imp uh, that even though it's called sum and not sum prime, it's smart enough to figure out that I don't know what I'm doing. Well, it appears as if I don't know what I'm doing since I'm implementing the sum function and just calling it sum prime, and, and that's why it's underlined. Okay, okay so and yes. Sorry, can I jump in? I, I don't know if the chat wants to see it, and you can just write in, but um, might it be helpful to show how you could actually make a list using colon? And then you can see how the patterns follow. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's, actually, that's actually a good idea, sort of how, how to sort of make lists, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, that's definitely a good idea. <clears throat> Maybe I'll <clears throat> have a few more list examples. And maybe the reason why I'll keep that, um, sorry, <coughs> well, I'll keep that back to next, next time. Sorry, while well, I'll keep that back to next time. Um, maybe it's better of a big jump for the first lecture to show people how to define their own types. Since essentially, if, if we want to define a list, we want to define our own type. And um, yes, yeah, so, so maybe next time sort of, uh, sort right. of, I'll start just, with, yeah? 
perhaps I thought I'd just make a list one, two, three using colon uh, uh, without do, do, worrying do, so, about what it means as such, but just show how it works. Uh, uh, I, I thought you want me to sort of show people, say I use another character mm. and not this. How no, can no, I define yes, it? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, uh, unless so, it's already known. Uh, I don't know. Can can anyone write in the chat if you've if you're very familiar with how lists work in, or if, at least how you think it will work in this context? So this something like this. This is sort of equivalent to the list one, two, three. So what the list one, two, three is, it's saying take one, and this. As an operator, which is called the cons operator. And cons to that, the list consisting out of two, three. So this is the head and this is the tail. So this is the notation that I'm using here. Yes, the head and that's the tail. So in my case, uh, one is the head and the two, three is the tail. Now with two, three, well, you take the head, which is two, and you add that to the left of the list, which is three. And there it ends. Now, the list that's three, it's the element three to the left cons with the empty list. So this one, two, three, this notation is just syntactic sugar for this. Okay, um, everyone's sort of happy there with, uh, hopefully that, that helps. Yeah, so now, now that we have this sum prime defined, oops, sorry, uh, we can just uh, I'm just reloading here in GHCI, the interpreter, I'm just reloading. Now I can again do sum prime of the list one to ten. And again, I end up with 55. Now, um, something else I sort of should also mention in the first lecture, I, I don't know if you guys, so, so sort of with Haskell, you, you have two things. You, you have the functional programming side um and we'll get a lot of things like you don't want to mutate state and things like that and i'll show you with examples what that implies and so on so uh, it's, it's sort of difficult to handle side effects and if you call a function with the same arguments every time you want to get the same answer so um that's sort of different than other non-functional languages but the thing I want to talk about now is Haskell is also lazy. So it's a lazy programming language. And um, so by default, it's lazy. And so that's where it's a little bit different from other um, functional languages. So, so let me just show you what laziness implies. So let me maybe do it here. So. Let me first show you guys this function head and say I just take the list one through 10. And here I'm just saying, give me the head or the first element to the list. And that should just be one. But since it's a lazy language, I can give it the list that starts at one and goes on infinitely long. Since what it will figure out is to evaluate head, it only needs the first element. So it's, it can see, well, there's more elements to come, but it doesn't care about those. It's, it's just ignoring this part of, of the evaluation and saying, well, I now have the first element and the head function just needs that first element. So I don't care about the rest. And again, I just get one. So the, and often one can write super nice code since you don't have to say where your list or in, uh, data structures sort of ends. You, you can use almost conceptually this idea of infinite structures since the language is a lazy language. Um, 
yeah, so let me maybe, let's do, let me delete that. And so, and we'll implement our own version. So let's look at this function tail. And so if we like take, say the list one to five and we say, um, give me the tail of this list. It's just going to give two, three, four, and five. But now, um, whoops, so that's not exactly what I wanted to do. Um, okay, so we do the list tail one through five, just two, three, four, five. But now what happens if I ask for the tail of the empty list? And it's going to throw exception. So let's write our own version, say, and let's call it safe tail, just to get used to lists and recursion and so on. Since um, in other languages, you might have um, your various kinds of loops or iterators or whatever you use. And Haskell typically, instead of loops, you use recursion. And the compiler is smart enough to do all kinds of things like uh, tail call elimination and so on. So even though it sounds super inefficient, um, it is in fact not. Um, since the language is so restricted, uh, the compiler can do crazy kinds of optimizations. So let's write our own version safe tail. And what safe tail should do is let's say safe tail of the empty list. Let's say that should go to the empty list. So you guys will, yeah. So let's say that should go to the empty list. But if we do safe tail, Otherwise, apart from that, safe tail is just equal to tail. So see if you guys can do that. Safe tail of the empty list is the empty list instead of the exception. But otherwise, safe tail is just tail. OK. Um, so there are a few ways to do that. So um, I guess we can just use what I had before, the idea with some idea. So safe tail of the empty list is just the empty list. <clears throat> and now safe tail, now remember here x cons x is, this is just the head of the list, that's the rest of the list. And here we're just saying, well, safe tail otherwise should just be um, <clears throat> the rest of the list and notice see here through type inference the compiler can figure out well i should take a list to a list this is what safe tail is doing and now if i just load my hs and i might not be There we go. And hopefully, well, let me get the example. Ask what is the type of safe tail? You see, safe tail takes A to A. And now I can do safe tail of the empty list. It's not going to throw exception. OK, so hopefully that gets most of you guys started and let me just maybe for the last 10 minutes and also to have a few exercises let me open up a few slides and um, these are just taken from Graham Hutton's um, website and this is what he uses in his first course um, and he starts off by just giving a basic introduction of what is a functional language and then a bunch of history. So I'm just going to scan quickly through it. So 
yeah, sort of the example where we just add the numbers one through 10 and, and some really ugly looking code, I guess. And, and then you would essentially just sum it like this, or you would do it with a fold or whatever. And then sort of the history, obviously it's based on Lambda calculus, so it goes back to Alonzo Church. And um, then I'm, I'm not gonna, you can sort of, this is sort of his first slide deck for his uh, first year um, functional programming course. So you can sort of go slower through this. Um, sort of so so he mentions Lisp um, that uh, was developed by uh, John McCarthy, sort of one of the first uh, functional languages, and uh, then he sort of just takes you through. And I'm just gonna scan through this and sort of to the start of Haskell, 1987, and uh, um, this guy Phil Wadler, Philip Wadler, he's got a lot of um, interesting papers and other resources on Haskell. And with others, he developed this whole idea that I've mentioned of type classes and brought in monads, which is um, a lot of people regard as um, you sort of see monads is crossed over to many other languages. So a lot of people regard that as one of the, the, the best inventions in programming over the last 10 years. So, so, so maybe I, I can check the audience. I guess some people in the audience program in Haskell. Um, oh, sorry, in, in Java. <clears throat> so you also have uh, monads in Java. So do any of you guys know what is the equivalent of bind? Or how do you typically know you're using a monad in, in, in Java? Or typically, what is the function that you need to use if you want to do the bind of, of, of monads in, in Java? Think, any, uh, any of you tried it? Yeah. Can we, there was just a question in the chat from Patrick mm. about the definition of safe tail. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, seems uh, that yeah. Safe tail, empty is empty. Safe. which oh so it's complaining oh let me just see so it's complaining that it's non-exhaustive so let me just check um yeah so sometimes we one do get that let me just see why aha uh -huh. so so yeah um okay cool so let's let's just so let me just go back to my vs code so just add this line so let's and then you guys tell me if you still get so safe tail of the single element let's just make that the empty list so you get everyone that got the non-exhaustive pattern error message, just add this line and, and tell me whether you still get the error. Uh, Zurab had a comment. I don't know if it resolves it um, to include the type specification and correct spacing. Yeah, so, so that's uh, something I'll, I'll, I'll mention. Yeah, and it's good to mention. Um, um, so Haskell is one of those languages where um, white space and how you indent things make a difference. And often you get error messages because of incorrect indentation. Uh, but Potter still has the problem, even after rewriting it this way. Uh, anyone else with the so you, you still uh, get I got uh, the same uh, when I put it in GHCI. Uh, you mean the same error? Same error, yes. So, yes, yeah, since you see, sort of, I can see why sometimes you get the non exhaustive pattern error since. 
essentially you want to specify it's most likely complaining since you don't have a pattern for all kinds of lists mm. but but zero didn't get the error nor did it, uh, guy yeah so i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure so hey, also i i didn't get it but so so this it's interesting that this didn't fix it for you since i thought when you got it it's just complaining that well i didn't specify the pattern for um well so so yeah since that's actually interesting so, so now that i think about it um, this third line of code of mine actually includes the second line since the excess could be the empty list. Yes. So, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so actually this line of mine is doing nothing. So, and you still get, you also get the array if you just go ahead and add the, the type signature. I'll just check that. And if Patrick also wants to try it. I'm just putting the file. Still, still, the, uh, still same issue. Got the area even with the fix. Yeah, yeah. So um, I wonder why it's complaining about non-exhaustive patterns in this case. Um, I guess an alternative. Also, it would be interesting if you get the same error here. So if we go with alternative implementation, safe tail of a list is just tail of the list. So now we're saying, well, if it's empty, we return an empty list. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we call tail in it. I think it's if you type it directly into GHCI instead of loading it from a file, then you can. Ah, OK. Then, then it complains. Ah, true, true, true. Okay, so, so everyone that got the errors, yeah. The bottle, okay, if you can type it in a separate file and then load it, uh, that seems to resolve the problem. Yeah, so, so essentially, yeah, type in a file, then you have GHCI open, then you load in GHCI the, the, the file, and then, and, and I suppose something that this code here also illustrates is that um, these patterns here that we specify, they sort of done one after the other. So it's first going to look at this first pattern. And now I, when I get to the second pattern, it will realize, well, the list of X's can't be empty. Hmm. So, so yeah, so let me just take one or two more minutes to wrap things up. So, um, I'll just show this and then one other thing on the next slide deck. So uh, what do you guys say? Oh, well, I, I, in a first Haskell lecture, this is typically code people tend to show to the students or the participants. So what is implemented in this piece of Haskell code? So the empty list should go to the empty list. And then this is the list X with the tail axis. And so what it's doing here, it's saying, well, let's apply this function that I'm defining here recursively. Let's define it on Y, so that's the defined down here. Then plus plus is list concatenation. So I'm going to define F and Y, get the answer. This is what I have here. List concat, the X, the list with just X. So that element in the list of its own, concatenate. And then I concatenate F with the Zs. And so the Ys is just everything from Xs that's smaller equal to X. And the Zs, everything 
that's larger than x. So let me see in the chat, everyone. Yeah, here. Yes. So um, great. So there's a, a one one person that oh, maybe the others just didn't want to say. So uh, this is just illustrating the recursive structure of uh, of of quicksort. So if you look at quicksort, and especially you just you don't do it in place. You just focus on the recursive structure of quicksort. This is this is quicksort, but just not doing it in place. And okay, so sort of last thing, just so that I can give you guys some homework. So with on Graham Hutton's slides, just have a look at his um, second slide deck, which he uh, labels first steps, and. Um, he takes you through all these various kinds of list functions. Um, he also mentions um, this whole layout rule and spicing is important and Haskell will complain if you do kind of things like this. And we, we can essentially use braces and semicolons, but we typically don't. And um, so, so just look at these, uh, just so once you have the environment, you want to play around a little bit, just look at some of these uh, five, try out these five exercises at, at the end of, of these slides. So this is sort of the uh, second slide deck after the intro slides. And yeah, so just try out. So, um, so say the function loss, so it should select the loss element of the list. So where head selects the first, you want to select the loss. So think how we can, so is there a way to sort of, so we've, I've introduced in fact, those two functions. Is there a way to write loss as the function composition of two other functions? Um, can you come up with, another definition and uh, and say the init function that um, essentially is like del, but it removes the last element instead instead of the first element so 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 especially so look at all five exercises but um, yeah especially three and five and i guess with two you'll see immediate or you should sort of quickly see or i guess two would also be good just to see if you can fix some syntax errors uh, saying things like um uh, it's it's no yeah essentially this is the name of a function and haskell doesn't like it if you start a function with a cap and so on yeah so so i i think that that was good progress for uh, for a first lecture. So let me stop screen sharing. Yeah, and, and obviously, um, every, everyone or any of you are sort of welcome to to just send me a message if you want to just um just send me at my Gmail brink. So I'll, I'll just post my Gmail address here in the chat. Yeah, so send me a, a message. If you want me to discuss other things, go quicker, go slower, application areas, um, just to sort of give me a hint of where you are on which level so that, that I don't go, say, too super slow. I, I figured anyway, the first lecture is maybe better to do err on the side of going too slow, which I most likely did. Yeah, Brin, thank you very much. It was a very nice introduction to the first guided first steps in uh, in Haskell. So thank you very much. I'm sure that everybody had lots of uh, lots of fun playing around with the lines of code that uh, that you suggested. I don't know, Yorick, if there are more questions or comments. If people want to raise their hand, we can give them the right to speak. If they would like to ask a question in person, yes, uh, I don't see any questions yet. But please, you're more than welcome. Yeah, Zirap, I'm obviously I'm 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 uh, every time I see you I'm I'm going to hassle you and ask you if you're still using Python. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, no, very good. <clears throat> yeah, no, Brink. It seems nobody wants to risk to to raise a to raise a hand. There, so there we, is another question. Sorry. Oh, so, oh okay. just a link to the slides. Yeah, yeah. Let me just get ah, yes. uh, get that. So. And there's a, a very nice question from Zurab. So we'll get to that after you've pasted the link. Uh, hi, can I ask the question? Yes, please. Yes, Zurab. please. Uh, so as I understand, uh, most of the things in Haskell will be functions. Mm -hmm. And uh, and of course, these functions are uh, kind of computer analogs of the usual mathematical functions. And so what I would like to ask is whether the list uh, type is also is a, a function or some some other primitive that is not itself a function let me just i'm just double checking here in ghci so that i yeah so, so right so I've, I've shown you guys how you can check the type of something so, so now what you can do so i i can guess i can just oh let me just do that and then uh, right so i guess everyone can see my screen now again right um so so you guys can just Go ahead. So here you can see that kind of what's called cons operator. It's in fact a function. So it's a function that you use to build up lists. And what cons is doing is it takes uh, any anything of type A, no constraints, takes a list and it returns a new list. So list itself is not a function. List is one of the types. A list list is a type, but um, you can regard that cons operator as a constructor. Because later the functions will also become types, right? We can or, or not. So uh, is there a distinction? Is there a clear distinction between types and functions? So so what a well so a function in general take one type to an, to another type but you, you also have the function type okay, so if you. i a function has the type typically a right arrow b so that's the type of a function so there is a distinction between types and functions and but a function have a specific type a goes to b a right arrow b that's the type of a function but there's a distinction between functions and types but um yeah it, you have essentially types and functions that's that's how you build everything and um then you have this idea of a type clause which corresponds to a uh, interface in in java and other languages and that's how you build everything Great, thank you, Brink. So it nicely corresponds to to objects and um, morphisms in a category. Objects. Exactly, arrows. exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, are there any more raised hands? I don't see any. Um, okay, if there are no more questions. Yorick, <laughs> I think uh, um, I, I just um, would like to thank uh, Brink and, and, and Yorick for putting together this very nice uh, in introduction. And, uh, and I would like to invite you to join us for a quick social with, with, with the lecturers, if they have time, uh, in our famous Kumo space. And I just go <laughs> in, the, uh, in, in, in the chat. So if you have five minutes and you want to chat a little bit with, with the speakers or with other participants, please join us, uh, join us there just now. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, again for the, for the nice lecture. We will continue next week. And uh, we will upload the video as soon as it is, uh, it is ready. And maybe we can put the link to the slides also on the NITEX website so it's easier for people to find. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. And, and thank you for organizing. We will sort it out.
Okay, thank you very much. Then I hope thank to you. see most of you in Kumo space just now. Thank you. We'll be there. Bye, CD. Bye-bye.